Good afternoon. Welcome to the Thursday, August 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Diversion Board of Authority. Let's take a roll, please. Mrs. Sherling. Here. Mr. Peterson. Here. Mr. Steen. Yes. Here. Dr. Mahoney. Here. Mr. Pepcorn. Mr. Grinberg. Here. Mr. Judd. Here. Mr. Hendrickson. Here. Ms. Carlson. Here. Mr. Campbell. Here. Mr. Wayland. Here. Mr. Thorsted. Here. Mr. Olson. Here. Carlson. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, item number two, we have the minutes from the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Corrections? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion carried. Um, moving on to item three, the order of the agenda. I believe we have a couple of uh, changes here. Madam Chair. Yes, um, Commissioner. I would like to, uh, under item number six, F, add a proposed cost share agreement with Horace. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Steen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move uh, finance number nine to number seven. We'll just switch those, so we'll put public outreach um, down to number seven then. Madam okay. Chair, I, I move the agenda as, uh, per, as recommended changes. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion or any other further changes? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Okay, then let's get right into the um, program management consultant report. All right. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. All right, the program controls report, the overall program status. Based on a program budget in 2018 dollars of $2.75 billion, actual cost to date as of July 31st, uh, 2019, including program financing costs and outstanding accounts payable, uh, is $491,031,000. We go to the fiscal year 2019 cash budget. Uh, based on a cash budget, of 162,723,000 uh, paid as of July 31st, 2019 is 37,298,000 or 37,298,000, leaving a remaining budget of $125,425,000 in the fiscal year 2019 budget. There's just a picture of that. We were expecting on plan to, to spend um, at this time about 95 million. We're currently expended 37 million. That's about 23% of the budget, fiscal year 2019 budget has been expended. Again, uh, we believe a lot of that's due to the lag in the um, ac uh, land acquisition. So we're expecting to see some bigger bumps as we go towards the end of the year once land acquisition uh, comes, the land acquisitions come through. Co-executive director approved contract items. There were two. Um, there was an amendment one to our task order three to close out the project. We adjusted the budget um, by decreasing the contract value by $10,000 to equal the actual expenditure on task order three. That closes out that, that task order. And then there was also an initial, initial agreement with Glacier Enterprises for $2,100 for the County Road 17 ditch spoil grading project. That's expected to be completed in mid-September of this year. Uh, activities and achievements on the in-town works, the work package 42E, which is a Second Street flood, uh, Second Street South flood mitigation project. Pro progress, uh, the project is progressing. Active work is the pump station, the gate wall, and the flood wall. And there's some pictures of removing the old lift station. And there's concrete placement of the new pump station lid right there. There's some aerial views. This was from last week. and. This is from yesterday, same project, and you can see over uh, where the red highlighting is, that's the actual lid on that new pump station that we saw in the earlier picture. So there's progress being made. Uh, the other projects currently ongoing, the Oxbow pump station project is nearly complete, just wrapping that up, and the home demolition work package 50A, there's a slight weather-related uh, scheduled delay, but no anticipated issues with that. On land acquisition and property mitigation status, 45 appraisals were approved last month, five parcels were acquired in the last month, and five purchase agreements have been signed. 
Uh, we continue securing rights of entry, issued an RFP to enter into task orders for appraisals uh, for other, um, some of the other main project components. Uh, continue to process and secure, um, to secure the environmental monitoring easements. Those are the biogeo easements. Supported the first and second meetings of the Minnesota Lands Acquiring Entity, which is the MCCJPA and supported their grant application for $46 million and continued support for the NDSU Ag's impact study. There's some pictures. This is included in the packet. This is the um, property acquisition report, status report. Uh, on the public outreach and social media activities and achievements, we produced um, some Minute Facts videos with Jason Benson and Nathan Borbaum published a North Dakota water article under, uh, about construction underway. And there's an analytics report on some of the social media that's being used uh, in regard to the project. On the short term look ahead, uh, there'll be a presentation at the Red River Basin Commission meeting on September 5th. There'll be a core agency meeting, which is scheduled for September 17th and 18th. We're looking to confirm the P3 proposal's remobilization schedule in September, um, finalize interim funding and financial strategy, and develop and present the fiscal year 2020 cash budget in the next three months, uh, as well as coordinate the upstream property rights and mitigation requirements with the North Dakota Office of um, State Engineer staff, meet with the city of Drayton on the dam replacement project, and continue securing rights of entry for the southern embankment. On the long-term look ahead, oh, no, sorry, this is still short-term. We had a lot of short-term activities coming up in the next three months. Uh, initiate acquisition activities in Minnesota, begin the appraisal work for the West Western Tieback and Red River control structure, update the communications plan and strategic outreach initiatives, and produce consolidated 30-minute project video for airing on um, public access TV and outreaching to 30 political jurisdictions related to the CLOMAR. On the long term, which is three to six months out, reactivate the P3 procurement, update the program reporting of budget and schedule, finalize the interim funding and financial strategy, uh, solidify upstream structure mitigation requirements in coordination with permitting agencies, achieve substantial completion of the work package 42E, which is what we just looked at, and negotiate the scope for the phase two flowage easement valuation. And that's the PMC update. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions from the board on that? All right, thank you. Then on to item number five, Ms. Williams with Corps of Engineers project update, please. Good afternoon. Uh, you should have our monthly update um, in your packet. On uh, number one, division, uh, diversion inlet structure construction, dewatering is completed. Uh, Ames is waiting until the site is drier before they go out and do final grading in the diversion channel portion. Um, the pile load test is now scheduled to start in October. Number two, the Wild Rice River structure construction. Proposals uh, continue to be due on 5 September. That date has not shifted. And we anticipate awarding a contract no later than November of this year. Uh, Red River structure design, uh, the folks down at Erdic continue to construct that model which should be done uh, about mid-October, and then after that they'll start uh, testing the model and then running alternatives, and that should all be wrapped up um, by June of 2020. Our design team is working on plans and specs for the Red River structure, and those, uh, the 35% level is due about February of 2020. Southern Embankment design, we also have a team working on the design of the Western tieback which we hope to build our award a contract in late 2020. And borings continue to be taken at locations along the entire alignment. Number five, cultural resources mitigation. The, work, the field work under task order one is complete. We're awarding a second task order with the same group of folks. And under task order one, um, they were able to drastically reduce the amount of acreage required to be cleared. Uh, task order two field work should start next week. Mm -hmm and we'll be done with that this fall. And as Kim mentioned, we have a natural resource agency meeting coming up in September. We try to do those at least two to three times a year, and we've been doing them since about 2008. And the goal of that is to update all of our agency partners, including those from 
uh, the North Dakota Minnesota agencies on what's been going on over the last few months. And with that, any questions? Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yes. Terry, thanks for your report. I'm just curious, maybe you can provide a comment or two, you know, with Plan B being the new um, project and the timeline. Where is the core in respect to their work um, product and, and the timelines? Are we meeting those timelines and moving forward? You know, we're sitting here in August and we've been talking about water for three months. And so I'm just curious where we're at, where you're at with the core's work based on the timeline that we put forward in the legislature this year. Uh, so a couple of months ago, we handed out the overall federal placement schedule that we're going to um, move forward with until um, maybe the, we know more about how the diversion channel construction is going to go. Um, we feel like we are on schedule. We're meeting our uh, goals for awarding the wild rice. We are, uh, the inlet of course is delayed due to the, dis the suspension and um, you look out there, you don't feel like a lot of construction's going on, but the critical path on, on the inlet is getting the gates. And so everything else has a little bit of float. So next year we'll see a lot more construction. Um, we're on schedule for the western tieback design. Um, we need to get real estate drawings to you, I think, in September, so you can start acquisition of, of the real estate for that. Um, we're making good progress on borings as we get access. Um, I feel like we're getting back on track again. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, thank you very thank much. You. Item two, item number six, here comes <clears throat> Mr. Shockley. He's been busy. The SRF loan application. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first item is an informational item for the uh, Diversion Authority Board. Uh, as the Diversion Authority Board uh, uh, will recall, uh, we are working up a financial plan for the project. As part of that financial plan, uh, we have several uh, lower cost of capital financing tools. Uh, in July, the board authorized submitting a letter of uh, interest for WIFIA. Uh, we are currently working up an application for the North Dakota State Revolving Loan Fund Program. Uh, we, would, uh, we would have been completed this month uh, on the SRF loan application. However, it is my understanding that because of some of the requests that are being made by Minot with respect to allowing utility relocations to be included within eligible costs for SRF loans, we may be able to increase the quantum of the principal amount on our SRF, SRF loan quite a bit, uh, perhaps from 50 million to close to 150 million. Uh, that is a 2% interest at a 30 year term, so it is very beneficial to the project and does have a material impact on the financial plan. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we're not quite ready to present the financial plan. Uh, but I did want to give you an update that uh, that is underway, and you'll be seeing that in your packet next month, and that'll be authorizing us to go ahead and submit that application on behalf of the Diversion Authority. Thank you. Questions on the loan? Okay. Then on to item B, the Executive Director Employment Agreement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first action item I have for you today is an employment agreement uh, with Mr. Joel Paulson, uh, who is in the audience today, uh, to serve as your executive director. Uh, the board went through an extensive hiring, pr uh, hiring uh, practice uh, and also an interview process, uh, and uh, he was a successful candidate. Uh, we have reached an agreement with Mr. Paulson. I've handed that out to you. Uh, just, I will give a brief overview of the terms and conditions of that agreement. Uh, first of all, uh, the executive director's salary is $195,000 per year. Uh, the benefits are provided through Cass County as per our normal benefits. That would include health insurance, uh, North Dakota PERS, and other uh, normal incidental benefits that are associated with Cass County employment. Uh, if the executive director needs to utilize a car for transportation, he has access to the carpool at Cass County. Uh, and if a carpool isn't available or if for some reason he has to leave for a trip, can't make arrangements, uh, it, his uh, mileage would be paid at the regular IRS rates. Uh, the agreement does provide for the divor uh, diver diversion authority to make a payment to him every month uh, regarding cell phone coverage to provide cell phone coverage, which is, and a smartphone, which would 
be something you would normally expect with a position like this. Uh, in six months, the board is, can conduct an initial review and then thereafter at one year and thereafter that would be every year. The agreement is for a term of one or term of three years. Uh, I can certainly answer any questions the board might have, but we have reached an agreement with Mr. Paulson on the negotiating side. Uh, the agreement before you is signed by him. So if you as a board are confident in moving forward, uh, you can have a motion to approve and it'll be a done deal. Madam Any questions, Chair, please. I would be willing to make a, a motion to accept uh, Joel Paulson as uh, the executive director. Thank you. Second. Um, you've heard the motion to um, to accept the agreement that has been put in place, uh, Commissioner. Peterson, question. Madam Chair, thank you, Mr. Shock. There's a couple items acknowledged within the contract that, I, that really talk about duties outside, meaning he's a, he's a city engineer, and it sounds like he's teaching as well. It is presumed that those will not cut into his regular job duties. It's just those are cursory, more of an acknowledgement of duties that uh, I call it moonlighting is the wrong word, but as I'm looking at him, he's smiling. So I'm presuming it's outside the parameters of whatever it will take to get this job done, just an acknowledgement. Is that correct or not? Correct. It's, that's a great question. The agreement uh, we set forth that uh, has to devote all of his time and attention to this position. Uh, there is a carve out for his uh, role as president of the Engineers Without Borders. We specifically put in a limitation. I uh, can't spend more than three hours per week on that. And then my understanding is uh, Mr. Paulson currently serves in the role of city engineer uh, for uh, the city of Middle River, Minnesota, and that is not in the role of making plans or specs. It's just evaluating whether or not the city should proceed with something that also has the same limitation. Uh, we didn't foresee any issue with it, but we wanted to call that out in the agreement so that there was comfort around that uh, Mr. Paulson's attention would be fully focused on this task, which I, I don't have any concerns about that. So, And he's got separate E&O, it looked like too, right? Arizona Mission Insurance? Yeah, he's required for the uh, position with the city engineering position with Middle River. He's carrying his own insurance for that, and that's called out in the agreement also. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Aye. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. And the motion carries. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Paulson. We are thrilled to have you joining us. <clears throat> so take some time, relax. September 1, we're going to start keeping you real busy. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. I, I, I would like to just follow up and, and give a, a thank you to our, co our previous co-executive directors for the work that they've done on this project and for Mr. Shockley with your involvement with to, to get this agreement worked out and to you, Madam Chair, for your uh, insistence that we get this executive director uh, in this year. I think all of this is good. I think uh, I'm certainly excited to see Joel hit the ground running on this project, and, and thank you to all those who are involved with this. Thank you, Commissioner Campbell. Um, just would add as well that um, the current co-executive directors will now have the title of, help me. Co-deputy. Co-deputy executive directors, so they're not going to go too terribly far. <laughs> but yes, thank you. I echo, echo your sentiments. So again, um, Mr. Paulson will start September 1. Thank you for all your efforts with that, John. And moving on to item 6C, the resolution <coughs> on maintenance of certain project elements. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a resolution requesting the City of Fargo undertake uh, maintenance of, uh, of various projects located within the city uh, that are part of the diversion uh, project. Pursuant to the Joint Powers Agreement that created the Diversion Authority, the Diversion Authority has the ability to request its member entities to maintain elements of the project once they're completed. Uh, so the uh, mowing, the uh, electricity, those sorts of issues would be taken care of by the member entity and then build back to the diversion authority. 
uh, in the years to come, we would see the southern embankment would be main, pro possibly maintained by uh, the Cass County Joint Board or maybe by the Diversion Authority. That's a decision left to the board, but that was provided for in the Joint Powers Agreement. This is just simply requesting the City of Fargo take on the maintenance of the it items identified in the resolution. Uh, um, Nathan from the City of Fargo can certainly answer any questions specific to the technical features. Uh, but my understanding is that this is consistent with uh, the projects being completed and with the diversion authorities already been paying some of the bills associated with these projects, like the electricity and some of the other maintenance issues. So this is formalizing that relationship. Thank you. So is there anything that we're missing here that this is pretty extensive, but I know there's been a lot of work done in the city of Fargo. I, I would defer to the technical folks on if there's additional features or Nathan is shaking his head no. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions, Commissioner Steen? Madam Chair, just to make a motion, the Finance Committee did, did review this yesterday and recommended approval, so I'll move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Thank you. Um, item D, approval of the new public outreach committee member um, with Mr. Paulson no longer engaged as a board member. We've got a couple of gaps, so Mr. Shockley, you want to discuss that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Pursuant to the Joint Powers Agreement, uh, a appointment to one of the committees requires approval by the Diversion Authority. My understanding is the City of Moorhead is recommending that Council, Council Member Carlson serve in the outreach committee position. And you'd need a motion, a second, and a vote to confirm that appointment. Thank you. I would move to appoint or Ms. Carlson to the position. Thank you, Commissioner oh, Campbell. I'll second. second. It's been seconded by the mayor. Um, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Do I need to have seen? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the motion carries. And yes, welcome, Council Member. We're happy to have you here. Um, and moving on to the Memorandum of Understanding with Cass County, Mr. Shockley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is an item that is associated with the Executive Director's Employment Agreement. Uh, because the Diversion Authority does not currently have any staff, it doesn't currently have an HR department, it doesn't currently have a Benefits Department. And so the co-Deputy Executive Directors and myself uh, brainstormed what would be the best way to handle the uh, administration of HR and benefits. <coughs> and we arrived at either having the city of Fargo or Cass County provide the benefits. Uh, for some discussion, we decided that Cass County was best suited for that role uh, and developed uh, MOU between Cass County and uh, the Diversion Authority for the provision of HR services. Uh, you will, will note that this is an interim agreement uh, for a period of six months. There is a provision under the North Dakota Century Code that allows entities to become co-employers. Uh, given that there may be plans with the coming executive director to hire staff, uh, we will probably pursue that option. However, that takes some time with the Secretary of State's office and some additional uh, work uh, on our part regarding provision of benefits, HR, and uh, just basic office administration. So uh, I met with uh, the county administrator along with the state's attorney from Cass County and we worked out an interim agreement to take us through December 31st and just to give us enough time to work out the re remainder of the agreement. Uh, we're adding two small housekeeping items uh, to the agreement uh, just regarding uh, a, a couple things that we picked up over the last couple of days that will be added. Uh, so I'd be asking uh, to approve the agreement and substantially the form presented. Uh, with a couple minor changes, and then I have to go back to the Cass County Commission at their meeting on the 2nd. Uh, some of the county commissioners wanted to see the employment agreement 
with the executive director because that's referenced in the MOU and just to kind of give the final blessing that everything's okay. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Shockley? And I would just point out as um, chair of the Cass County Commission, I'll be signing this and Commissioner Campbell will be signing uh, for the Diversion Board of Authority. So we don't have just my signatures on this document. Any other questions? Commissioner Steen. I move to approve the memorandum of understanding with Cass County. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. <coughs> Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 6F, we have the cost share agreement with the City of Horace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, over the, la the course of the last couple of months, uh, the Diversion Authority <coughs> has been working through its staff with the City of Horace regarding the development of an agreement uh, for the allocation of costs associated with infrastructure that's uh, uh, potentially affected by the Diversion Authority project, specifically the Diversion Channel and the Inlet. And so through a lot of hard work and negotiations, and I would recognize uh, Mayor Mahoney had spent a lot of personal time on it and went to the Horace City Commission on Monday night, and we were able to reach an agreement uh, with the City of Horace. Uh, this is uh, kind of a prelude to our MOUs that will be coming up with different third parties, including utilities. As part of the diversion project, we have to relocate and realign infrastructure. And this agreement, uh, specific to Horus, uh, will help facilitate those other agreements. And so we will be uh, creating, uh, rather than having the diversion authority decide what infrastructure needs to be adjusted in Horus, uh, we created a fund in which the city of Horace uh, can utilize up to a set amount of dollars with a cost share to apply towards some of those infrastructures, uh, infrastructure items that have been impacted. Uh, this agreement has been worked through with some of the leadership, the diversion, uh, and I know the city of Horace would like to approve it. Uh, my understanding is that they're planning on calling a special meeting next week to approve it, so they're looking for the diversion authority to approve. Uh, I'm, if you have any questions, I could answer, or Mayor Mahoney could certainly answer also. Questions? Um, Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Shockley, why five million and not one million, or why five million and not 10 million? Theoretically, are there certain projects that we've already identified? I'm kind of looking at my county engineer, too, uh, and then city administrators as well. Are there projects that we know are going to have a direct impact because of the diversion, the diversion channel, the diversion activities, or? How did we get to five million? Well, uh, I'll let the maybe the mayor can best answer the question. As he was, uh, the agreement really kind of formed around uh, the presentation the mayor had given down in Horace. And uh, I don't know if you want to respond or I can respond. <laughs> yeah, the difficulty to your question is, is as when it got in negotiations with Horace, it was unclear exactly how much infrastructure they needed. Great question that you asked. So when we went into that, um, they have some water issues that would like to regionalization. We can do that. We have some water, uh, wastewater issues as well. And we are presently doing a project on it. They did request us to do that, but we didn't have the final price. So we said, well, how do we do this? Well, in speaking to Governor Burgum, uh, he would like uh, some of these projects that are regional and are in a smaller communities where I think, Brent, you say you're going to double your population in five years. They have such massive growth, they need an outreach. And what outreach is, is that the Water Commission does have money available to help them fund infrastructure growth. So what we suggested is that we, the, the number that Corey Peterson and Brent came up was approximately 20 million in infrastructure costs that they had. And in talking to the governor's office, he felt we should apply to the Water Commission for that 20 million. You apply to the Water Commission for 20 million, it's a 75-25 cost share. So the state, as a grant, would give them 15 million. We, as a grant, as a commission, would help them with the additional 5 million, but we felt the horse should have some money into it, so they decided on an 80-20 cost share. So the Diversion Authority would put up 4 million, and the City of Horse would put up 1 million. 
that gets them through their infrastructure. Now, it may not cost $20 million. We're just saying if that's, that's where you think it is, we wanted to have funding available for that and also <laughs> felt that the diversion would put that money out there to help them in their infrastructure costs. By the council and by myself, we thought that was a fair, fair way of doing it because we don't know what it is right now. <clears throat> but they have a question of a contested hearing, which they have to decide by next week. But because we had that vagueness in talking to the chair, chairperson Mary, we said, well, we, don't, we, can't, we can't put an exact figure, but let's get approximations in there that seem to work for both parties. And checking with the leadership, uh, Kevin and Mary, we felt that this was reasonable in this request. And we do have enough infrastructure impacts to the community that $5 million seemed like a reasonable amount. Okay. So long story short, there is some quantity. It is quantifiable. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and maybe, maybe I can add a little bit to that, too. Uh, with respect to the diversion channel, as we've worked out our third-party MOUs, there are certain impacts to the different mm -hmm. communities, such as bridge crossings. And so we felt that uh, with respect to whether a community needs a bridge crossing or whether it's utility relocates, uh, there, there is an estimate of how much that would cost and we base that off of it. Um, for, for example, West Fargo needed one additional bridge that was above and beyond what we'd originally contemplated in the project and that was to ensure the connectivity with 32nd and 52nd, which are major, uh, major roads through both Cass County and West Fargo. And so this really was a, a cooperative agreement so that the parties could work together on those infrastructure needs. And it also ensures uh, that we don't have any delays on the P3 project. <clears throat> and I would just add as well that there is, um, you know, there's complexities in, in, in regionaliz regionalizing um, some of this in infrastructure. So some of these other agreements will be between the city of Fargo and Horace. Um, they'll be for uh, rural water agreements. There's uh, issues with the railroad bridge that, you know, is going to take some work to try to resolve what the best course will be, and, and we'll have to work with the railroad on that. Um, there might be some benefit to doing something else with Horace if we can get agreement from the rail from the BSNF. So um, th this this is lays the groundwork, um, but there's going to be other things that are, are going to have to be resolved down the road. But we, you know, this is what we can do today. And um, Commissioner Grinberg and then Commissioner Campbell. Just two questions. Um, Commissioner Steen chaired finance yesterday. Was this a discussion on the agenda? I was absent. Uh, was this a discussion? <clears throat> no, it was not. And the second question is, um, we're adding $5 million to the $2.75 billion project by adding this $5 million, is the way I see it. And so where is it going to come from, from a finance uh, co-directors or Mr. Nicholson? Um, is this in the infrastructure line in the overall estimate of P3? Um, because I'd be really <coughs> hesitant to vote for something that's starting to chip away at our contingency. Commissioner Gunberg and members of the board, um, these costs like these are considered part of the mitigation line item, and there's a fair amount of uncertainty around that, but uh, it's uh, not a significant number and believe that uh, it's certainly coverable with the budget we have in place of 2.75. Let the record reflect Mr. Nicholson's comments. Mr. Campbell. Yeah, thank you. I, I just, uh, you know, working um, through the executive group on this, uh, um, this to me, it, it shows a, a good faith effort on the part of both, both entities here, understanding that this project will have some impacts to an area. And we've said all along that our intent is to mitigate those. And this is a perfect example of exactly what, what we've said we would do. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to see this document, and I think the more that we can keep these things out of the courts and, and settle them amongst uh, jurisdictions based on uh, as, you know, what, what Chad asked about in terms of costs, um, I think this is the way to go, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this, this uh, agreement. Thank you, Commissioner Campbell, and I would reiterate, I think the Diversion Board has, has shown good faith throughout those last several months in working with City of Horace, and, and I hope it's reciprocated um, and recognized by the, the Horace City Council um, that we have done so. 
The other thing that needs to be noted, just so you know that, is the county does have some CIP things that they moved up for horse with the light of the new school. So the council wanted to thank the county for some of the things it's done, and that's different than the five million, but out of your CIP, the budget you as the county had, you moved some projects they had to help out horse. So I know Corey Peterson would want to say thank you for that, because we did talk about it at the council meeting. So you guys already have stepped up in one area that really helped, and Jason has done a great job. So they just wanted to say that. So thank you. Madam Chair, I would move the diversion project cost share agreement as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to approve the cost share agreement. Are there any other questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? <coughs> Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. And the motion carries. Uh, as stated before, we're going to move finance up now, and so we will have the financial report, please. Great. Uh, first item on the uh, finance report is a financial report and Tim has covered most of the financial information that we reviewed in finance committee yesterday. Just one other item if you turn to tab 9A. There's just a br really brief summary that I'm going to go through on that page. Uh, total expenditures to date on the cash budget 582 million. Uh, total, excuse me, total revenue to date 582 million. Total expenditures 491 million. Uh, with a remainder then of 91 million. If, if you turn the page, the 91 million is made up of cash, 95 million remaining cash receivable from uh, Oxbow lot sales of 499,000 for a total of 95,505,000. Total liabilities payable, 4,328,000 for a net position of 91,177. With that, as far as the financial report, uh, we did review uh, the other information yesterday. No significant questions were raised, and I would um, move to uh, receive and file the report. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to approve the financial report. Uh, any questions? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Jed? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Motion carries, and now we have the vouchers. Next item is nine in tab 9B, and finance did review that yesterday, and I would move to approve $660,612.06. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Grinberg. Any questions on the vouchers? Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. And the motion carries. And now, without further ado, task order number six. And with that, we'll call, and he's already there. <laughs> John, back up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before you, you have task order six with Jacobs to reconsume or re. To recommence the P3 uh, procurement. Uh, just briefly, the reason why uh, this is coming before you is in April of this year, the federal district court authorized the Diversion Authority to recommence the P3 procurement. Uh, given the size and complexity of the P3 uh, procurement, along with the necessity of uh, really looking through what our financial plan is, we took our time in developing this task order uh, to recommence the P3 procurement. Uh, I do have a presentation on the uh, task order given its size. It's a $43 million task order over a period of six years. And so we really felt, uh, myself, along with the co-deputy executive directors, that it was really important to take our time and get this right. I will note that this task order uh, also will be accompanied next month or the month after that uh, with a task order for HMG uh, for uh, technical design engineer consultant services associated with the P3 that would also be spread over six years. And that's anywhere in the range of 10 to 
11, $12 million for that task order. So there'll be a, an additional task order coming before you. Uh, uh, the relationship between Jacobs and the Diversion Authority is governed by an MSA, that's the Master Services Agreement that was signed on January 13th of 17. Uh, that will be expiring in 2020, so we'll have to go ahead and renegotiate that soon. Uh, the MSA allows for the authority to authorize specific task orders. Uh, the procurement was delayed to fi uh, finalize the finance plan. As I said earlier, we're still waiting to finalize the SRF plan. Uh, task order six uh, is for the procurement, uh, support, design, and construction and contracting man uh, monitoring activities associated with task order six. The term runs through 60 days after project financial or uh, project final completion. Uh, we would envision that could be in 2026, so it would be six, 60 days after that, and maybe in 2027. Uh, generally, the task order resumes the P3 procurement. It assists in the selection of the preferred proposer. Uh, you'll recall one of our goals uh, as a team is to secure uh, and select a preferred propo proposer along with their technical proposal and financial proposal by the end of December, by the end of 2020. So we're expecting that in the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, the task order also uh, provides for assistance in the execution of the project uh, agreement with the developer, uh, with administering the project agreement, uh, and then, as I said before, this is authorized by the federal court when it modified its injunction. Uh, there are a number of specific tasks that are set forth in task order six. Uh, some of them are only authorized when the diversion authority gives notice. Uh, I wanted to make sure that in the event that there was some type of slowdown or some other event that delayed the procurement, the diversion authority had control over what services would be provided and when. Uh, so just briefly, that's procurement services, contract award support, issuance as a notice to proceed, monitoring of activities during design and construction, management of payment mechanisms, design and construction period completions, and management of utilities and third-party agreements. Uh, one of those third-party agreements was just before you. That would be the Horus Infrastructure Agreement that will lead to additional agreements with Horus given its close proximity both to the inlet and the diversion channel. I wanted to give just a brief overview of why P3 is different and why this task order might be a little different. And so to do that, I'm just going to briefly contrast the traditional delivery of a contract versus the P3 delivery. So under a traditional contract, you have an owner's representative that oversees development and management of the project. The owner, through uh, contracting with a design engineer, uh, defines what to build uh, and how to build it with plans and specs. Uh, those of you on boards that award contracts are familiar with a large set of plans and specs that are approved by the engineer and then ultimately the governing board and sent out to the <coughs> contracting community to build on. Uh, and then after they're bid on, uh, the construction starts and the owner engages a construction management firm. Uh, there is an independent contract or independent agreement with the contractor and then the uh, entity assumed the public entity assumes responsibility for operations and management as we know this can lead to disputes between the construction manager the contract builder and the design engineer which often leads to change orders which some councils or commissions uh, don't really care for having sat before many of uh, many of different boards change orders are never popular with a public private uh, partnership with the p3 delivery it's a much different uh, mechanism of delivery. So the PMC still manages and oversees the development of the project for the owner. However, the owner simply defines what needs to be performed through performance specs. Uh, I like to make a comparison to a typical street where you'll have full plans and specs versus technical requirements under a P3 agreement in which you'll set forth we need a six-lane highway that can sustain speeds of 65 miles per hour, have certain turning intervals, uh, and certain uh, sustain certain weights of traffic and not produce certain noise levels, rather than specific and detailed specs. Uh, in this model delivery, the uh, owner has technical services provided uh, by its design engineer for verification, but it doesn't actually engage in the design. 
the owner here, the diversion authority, then enters into a contract with the P3 developer who is obligated to produce what is referred to as a quality management plan, which is really critical to the overall project. And you'll hear that term a little bit later. But what a quality management plan is, is the plan on how the project will be delivered and how they will assure that it is delivered in a quality fashion in accordance with the performance specs. And it is really critical to have the diversion authority review and approve uh, that quality management plan and avoid a developer simply taking another plan off the shelf from a different project and submitting it to the entity for approval. And that really dictates how the uh, that quality management plan really dictates how the authority's representative will impose what are referred to as non-compliance points during construction for failures to deliver the construction or the infrastructure in a manner that's consistent with that quality man management plan. The P3 developer will hire a design build contractor that has a design engineer, a contract builder, and then they will assume operations and maintenance. For our project, uh, they will not be operating the channel, but they will be maintaining it for a period of 30 years after it is constructed. Uh, and in the traditional delivery model, the owner, uh, I just wanted to give just a brief overview of why, why do we care about this uh, with respect to this task order. So in a traditional delivery model, the owner has a very, very large team on its side. It has design engineers, it has construction managers, and it has a PMC. Because you have somebody on site monitoring the work at all times, uh, keeping construction logs, you have your own design engineering uh, group, uh, and then you have uh, your PMC. So there's very large, uh, very large uh, owner's representative team. In the public-private sphere, uh, the owner has a much smaller team. So you still have a PMC that's overseeing and managing the development of the project, uh, whereas the owner's design engineer is a much smaller team, and it's providing owner verification. So as the work's completed, they're just out there to verify that it's been completed, and the PMC is making sure that the project is being completed within the quality management plan. And so it's really shifting the burden of producing the project over to the developer rather than shifting the burden of making sure the project is completed in a quality manner to the owner. And so it's, it's a burden shifting, it's a risk allocation to a specific party, and if they don't meet those risk, uh, if they don't meet those requirements in the quality management plan, then the authority can impose non-compliance points, and that reduces and sets off uh, any type of milestone payments that they can receive during construction. So it's very critical to have a PMC team and a technical uh, design engineer consultant that are integrated and working together to deliver the project. Uh, from your general counsel's standpoint, I want to ensure that we don't have people out in the field that are telling uh, contractors that they can go ahead and undertake certain work and the contractor saying, okay, that's fine, and then they keep doing it over and over and it's not, it's not consistent with the quality management plan. And so we want to make sure that we have a good integrated team, and this is what Task Order 6 is really trying to accomplish. Uh, the accountability for performance and quality, uh, we tried to set forth what the difference between the traditional liver delivery and the public-private partnership is, uh, and it just sets forth how that risk is allocated between the two parties. Uh, I'm, going to just speed through the rest of the slides and just cover briefly each of the sections. Uh, so 6A covers procurement support. That's the drafting of the RFP uh, that includes the ITP, the project agreement, and the technical requirements, and that's developing comparative cost estimates and schedules uh, leading to the selection of the preferred proposer. Uh, we intend to have that completed in the final quarter of 2020. Uh, <clears throat> that task would commence upon execution of the task order by the Diversion Authority. Contract and award and support, uh, that is to provide P3 contract award support, uh, and that's following selection, including subtasks for commercial and financial close. So once we select a preferred proposer, uh, then we will go to commercial close and financial close. Commercial close means all of the terms of the agreement are done and financial close occurs shortly thereafter. That's when the developer receives all their funding from their lender. 
And so there's sp very specific roles for the PMC during those, uh, during those tasks to ensure that the contract is being followed and the requirements for commercial close and financial close from a technical standpoint have been met. The issuances of notice to proceed uh, under a P3, the developer hasn't fully designed the project when they bid. And so there'll be notices to proceed uh, with the design and then the ultimate construction of the project. Uh, those are NTP1 and NPT2. Those will be recommendations to the Diversion Authority Board. Uh, once again, this task commences upon notification from the Diversion Authority. If there was a delay for some reason, it wouldn't be necessary to authorize that action today. Uh, monitoring of activities during design and construction. This is probably the largest tranche of work. Uh, that's very descriptive of what is gonna be happening. That's to develop and implement a construction management services plan, an audit schedule, and processes to monitor the developer's activities, including the non-compliance checking program. The non-compliance points are levied against the developer if they fail to comply with the agreement. And so during the construction term, the developer will be entitled to some milestone payments, not the full payment. So for example, if it's a billion dollar contract, uh, they could get up to $500 million of milestone payments with the remainder spread over uh, their 30 years. And that precise ratio is still being negotiated. But during those milestone payment calculations, if they're not complying with the project agreement, the PMC, uh, along with uh, general counsel, will work together to figure out what the non-compliance points are, and that would reduce their milestone payment. Ultimately, somebody is going to have to uh, step before the Diversion Authority Board and say it is okay to make this payment of $150 million to a developer. And so there's, there's some risk involved in making that determination, and I wanted a wanted to make sure there was assurances to the Diversion Authority Board that whoever's making that recommendation, you can feel confident that it can be paid. Uh, management of the payment mechanisms, uh, that's to develop and implement a process and procedures for the milestone payments that we talked about and the payment deductions. Uh, this is gonna be working with the Diversion Authority's financial advisor, Ernst & Young. Uh, this is including developing the payment processes and procedures. Once again, we have to give notice before this task can be undertaken. And then design construction period completions, uh, recommend interim completions, milestone one completion, and substantial completion. So it's reviewing and inspecting work and verifying the different completion stages of construction. Once again, this will only commence upon notification of the diversion authority. Uh, the final is the management of the utility and third party agreements. Uh, there'll be a slew of third-party agreements that are going to be coming before the Diversion Authority in the coming months. Uh, there are approximately anywhere from 500 to 1,000 various utility crossings under the channel. Uh, they can be as simple as a cable connection or fiber optics or water lines or power lines. Uh, there are several utility companies that we've been working on developing uh, agreements with each of those companies through the relocations of their utilities because according to core rules, uh, you can't penetrate the embedded levy, so you have to go under it, which requires certain construction techniques and there's always a discussion of timing, uh, construction techniques, and how does that integrate with the P3 developer. I will say that most of those third-party agreements have reached about 95 to 98% completion and we're kind of going through the final, uh, final steps of getting those ready to come before the Diversion Authority. Uh, have a brief organizational chart. I can answer any questions that you ha have regarding that. That's included with the task order. Uh, probably most important is where does the task order break down, the 43 million. So part 6A is for about 5 million. That's the procurement support. 6B, the contract award support is 800,000. The issuance of notices to proceed is about 400,000. As I had indicated, the monitoring during design and construction being the largest tranche of work is 29 million. Once again, that's only upon authorization from the diversion authority. The management of the payment mechanisms is something that gets filtered throughout the whole process. That's about 400,000. Uh, the design construction period completions is about 4 million and the management of the utilities and third parties is about four million. Uh, the task orders for the design engineer, uh, design engineer 
typically revolve around some of the management of the third party utilities and doing the inspections along with the monitoring and design work uh, and then so, and support during the procurement. Uh, on an annual basis, Jacobs is required to submit a spending curve reflecting cost today and, ex and the anticipated expenditures through the term. And on a monthly basis, they're going to report on actual expenditures against the approved spending curve. I can certainly answer any questions you have. I'm sorry to have such a long presentation, but I thought it was, given the large size of the task order, it was important that you feel educated about what you're approving. Thank you. Uh, Yes, go ahead. Madam Chair. John, how were the tasks split out? I mean, you had this bucket of tasks. How, how did you decide um, what uh, Jacobs was going to do? So the tasks were split out according to how a, a normal P3 uh, occurs. I mean, each all P3s are different in the type of infrastructure you're building, but they all have sort of a cadence to, you know, you have a procurement, you have your payment mechanism, you have your construction and monitoring. And so that's how the buckets were set up. Uh, and then we worked through how much would be allocated to each bucket based upon the amount of time and effort that would be involved in each of those buckets. And our goal was uh, to really have the PMC be the administrative arm and the boots on the ground and the, tech, the technical issues are going to go to the technical advisor uh, for the verification. That's sort of trying to bring in the outside experience uh, regarding the P3 that we need, yet utilizing the local resources that we have available. So there, Jacobs is not competing with our local um, group here? You know, just, I just want to make a statement, John. Um, I've been on this since we started. And our mission, we had a mission statement and we had some goals in that mission statement, uh, not only uh, flood reduction risk to the FM area, um, we also made a statement that we'd be fair, flexible, and friendly with the people that we need to work with and, and uh, acquire land. We also made a very strong statement that we at all possible um, that we would use local labor to uh, to do a lot of the a lot of the tasks for the, this project. And I'm I'm wondering in in your discussion in your group and, and again I would like to know who was in the group to decide but was that statement uh, considered when you um, divvied up the buckets? It, it was, and the people that have worked on the owner side uh, on the task order would be myself. Uh, we've worked with the co-executive directors and also had input from the local engineering staff. Uh, that would be the engineer, city engineer for uh, Moorhead, county engineer, uh, and then also uh, Nathan from the city of Fargo. We did very much recognize the need to have uh, local services provided, and we took a really hard look at what services needed to be provided by whom. I would also note that this is just relating to the diversion channel. This does not cover work that's related to the southern embankment. It doesn't relate to in-town work. It doesn't relate to work in Oxbow. This is a task order to cover the diversion channel. And so we were very mindful of that, and that's I was very mindful of that, trying to carve out as much as we could for the, the local consultant uh, uh, and making sure that we we're getting the best value for what we need. My, my concern is we are dealing with very sophisticated teams uh, and they're going to need, we, we are going to need somebody who has done a P3 before to calculate the non-compliance points to tell you, uh, can we go forward with this payment, can we not? Because if we're not calculating those non-compliance points properly, if we're not doing those efforts, it's a recipe for litigation. And as general counsel, I want to make sure that we don't get in a litigation situation over a huge contract. And so that was, that was our goal. That was my goal when I was drafting this, to make sure that we're properly allocating the work, but also we're giving it to those who are most experienced in the issue. In task order, for example, in task order five, we shifted all of the permit monitoring to the local engineer 
uh, and same in this agreement, all the permit compliance and monitoring, that's still sitting with the local engineer. So there's work that's outside of this task order that's already being done. Uh, and I don't know the, how much that is, but uh, the permitting compliance, uh, uh, but it's, it's separated out along with as many tasks as we can. And they're still during the procurement. Uh, we're depending upon uh, the hydraulic modeling and a lot of other uh, uh, types of activities that are being performed by the technical, uh, the local design technical consultant. And then uh, on the local side, the sub uh, for Jacobs is also performing a lot of the land acquisition services, uh, and that was undertaken in task order uh, three uh, for all the land acquisitions, which was about 20 million, which is, I think, almost entirely through the local local consultant that's a sub of Jacobs. So definitely familiar with that issue and we've been trying very hard to you know, allocate those, uh, allocate those buckets of work, so to speak. Continue, Mr. Olson. I don't have a problem with overseeing the local work and making sure that it, <coughs> because it is a complicated project and overseeing that. I guess I have a problem if that crosses the line into uh, competing with the local, um, the local companies that want to work on this project. So I, I understand the expertise that comes along with uh, Jacobs, 100%. But if it crosses a line into competition for um, some of the, the expertise that we have locally, then I would have an issue. Um, Mayor. Roger, good news for you. We just hired a CEO. That's his job. He's supposed to get as much local work local, and I think anybody on this board would agree with that because we oftentimes know outside consultants are oftentimes double or triple what our prices are local. So I think that's part of what Joel has also offered in his interview, and in his interview he talked about looking at contracts and what we could get local, we'll keep local, and what we have to do national, we'll keep national. There's some things we do need on the big experts, the P3 contract, some of the stuff we've never done before, so I think that. But I think, Mary, I think we're very firm that with our new CEO, we'll have that watched a little bit more closely. I think our co-chairs had done a great job, our co-directors had done a great job, and I just think they'll continue to do that. As you know, this is always contentious to this community because all the locals do want to be taken care of, and I think that's the commitment of the DA board is that we, as much work as we can keep local, we'll give local. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what the mayor said. And also, uh, a couple things. Is this going to be, so first question is, understanding how we got to these totals, there must have been some sort of an hourly designation on so many people per week, man hours. Yeah. Are we able to see that, A, and then B, is it presumed that this is almost like an hourly to a max contract, or is this a flat fee contract? So, uh, Great question. So yes, we saw the production of the FTEs for each uh, position. Uh, I will note that through negotiations, this is down from where it originally started. It started much higher, so we negotiated it down and tried to split out as much work as we could. Uh, second, uh, the hourly rates are based upon the hourly rates contained in the MSA, plus what we would anticipate would be reasonable increases. That is subject to negotiation. It's always subject to negotiation with the new MSA regarding those hourly rates. Uh, and this is a maximum contract. This is not a guaranteed amount. This is a budget. And so it doesn't mean that they're gonna spend this full amount. Uh, this is just the budget amount for each of those items. And second, if I can, you, second question, I think page 26 has the 30 day out. Is it literally that cut and dry, Mr. Shackley, where we can have 30 day notice and walk away. Yeah, in the MSA, you have to give notice and follow the contract, but, but yeah, you can get out, you can terminate the MSA. Perfect, thank you. And I, I would just add, I appreciate the comments, um, Roger and Tim and Chad. Um, there, a lot of hard effort went into this, but when our injunction was modified last spring, uh, that, you know, winter, that seemed like this was one of the big reasons that I really felt it was time to get an executive director in place just to make sure that we are addressing all of the concerns that you have, Roger. So I, I think um, this is all part of moving forward and um, I, I, I think that uh, all the, the effort that John put into this will uh, prove worthwhile in the end. So uh, any other questions? 
Comments or motion, please? Move to approve. Um, Chuck has a question. Mr. Hendrickson. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, uh, there's no question. I just want to thank John for all his hard work. It was mentioned at the Finance Committee yesterday, but just looks like, a, do you ever sleep? <laughs> it just looks like a ton of work, so I really appreciate it. And in your support staff, too, so thank you very much. So there was a motion? Yes. Move to approve. And a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Any further discussion? And Mr. Shockley. And just a reminder, we are working on the task order for HMG that will be coming before the board regarding the local services that will be split out for this procurement. So. Thank you, I look forward to seeing that. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. And the motion carries. And now we are on to work order number six. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a similar vein. Uh, a number of years ago, we retained a national P3 council, Ashurst LLP. Uh, while we're doing most of the work that we can from a legal, uh, legally, locally, there are certain items where we need their experience on regarding the P3 contract. Uh, and just frankly, from my perspective, uh, it's nice to have the resource of somebody who's actually completed a contract, a large $1 billion contract. You're dealing with la such large sums, it, having a second set of eyes is very important. Uh, given their expertise in the industry and being a New York law firm, their hourly rates are certainly much higher than our hourly rates. Uh, that said, this earlier this year, I was able to secure from them that they would not increase their hourly rates from what they first quoted us about three, four years ago. Uh, they only perform services as requested. Uh, the last task order that was approved was a very similar size, but I think we did not expend, we didn't expend much of that task order. Uh, this would be the same way we would expect that it would only be upon request of them performing work. Uh, so we came up with just a round number every month and a worst case scenario of what it would be if we needed to request their services uh, for different uh, activities associated with the P3 contract. Once again, most of the work is being done locally, but there are items that we need assistance with at, on the P3 level. And to be frank, it's good to have that experience with somebody who's done these transactions before. Questions? Move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any, any further questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Aye. Mr. Hendrickson? Aye. Ms. Carlson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. And the motion carries. Again, thank you, Mr. Shockley, and to all the staff that worked diligently on this, um, particularly our co-executive directors. And moving on now to item eight, whatever item it is now. <laughs> Public outreach. Committee report, please. That'd be me. Thank you. We did not have a meeting yesterday, conflicts with uh, some of the members we decided to cancel till next month. However, at this time, I would uh, like to thank Joel for uh, being a member of the, our outreach committee and, and uh, your insight to, to how we can uh, reach, reach out to people. We appreciate that and look forward to working with you um, as our, our lead. Probably one of the biggest, uh, biggest things coming up is that Clomer um, and how important that is to our project. And in an outreach, um, I think that's a very important um, document that's coming. So we'll look forward to that and uh, any outreach we can do from that point, we'll, we'll look to do so. Thank you. Roger, I just have one question. Have you, has your committee discussed at any great length um, 
how we're going to, you know, it seems like when we go to public meetings, there's just some real confusion about how people are affected between plan A and plan B. And I, I would just encourage you, as, as we've turned this corner now, I really feel like public outreach probably needs a different focus. At least that's what I see when I'm out um, and about, just even from the general population. Um, there, there just seems to be, you know, real confusion um, on particular landowners. And I know they can go to our website, but I, I don't know that they do. I don't, I don't know that they're calling the right people. And you know, I, I think we need to maybe do a better job of trying to get that word out. We have discussed that, wondering if we should have some public meetings to um, get more information directly to the people and give them an opportunity to go directly to somebody that would have an answer for them. We have, we have talked about that and probably see a, a strong need for that now as we've nailed down the project and this is it. And now the information we provide should be 99% accurate. As, as the design you know, continues, certainly you know, things will change somewhat. But, but the impacts, I think, are pretty well known. And um, I think Mary, uh, Commissioner, Sherling, we um, we will take that under advisement and and look at doing that. And Terry mentioned the Western Tieback today. I'm just have have those <clears throat> property owners been all notified, or do we have that nailed down? Do you know? Yeah, Eric, maybe you could add that. <clears throat> Is this something we haven't really talked a lot about? Um, yes, uh, Eric Dodds, AE2S. We've been in contact with the property owners for the Western Tieback. As Terry mentioned, uh, the Corps has requested a rights of entry to do some soil boring work down there. Um, over the past couple months, we've been meeting with Normana Township officials who are involved or very familiar with that location. If you recall, originally the alignment was more diagonal through those fields. And we had proposed to sort of have a zigzag in it so it followed the section lines. We met with the core, talked about that approach, shared that approach with the township officials down there, and they appreciated the, the zigzag following um, section lines rather than cutting through all these fields. And so that has been presented to some of the property owners. Uh, more recently, we do have a, an army of land agents out there meeting with property owners um, as we speak, trying to secure rights of entry to do some of the soil boring work. So. This is uh, an, an activity that's been ongoing, and it's definitely a priority area as we move forward here. Thank you. OK, Metrocog, please join us and um, tell us about your ideas for a recreation plan. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Joni Giese. I am with SRF Consulting Group. Uh, we have been retained by Metrocog to help them uh, assist them in developing a recreation plan for the for the diversion channel. Um, so. As we're moving forward here, the goal of the uh, diversion, the recreation plan for the diversion is to really create a wide variety of year-round recreational opportunities uh, along the diversion. And um, as we're doing that, we also see this as an opportunity to uh, restore um, some native plant communities and create habitat along the diversion as well. We also see this as an opportunity to I'm sorry, I'm going to take just one second here to see if I can find our presentation. I'm not sure that I'm finding it, so I'm just going to have to talk you through it. Excuse me. We have it in our packet so we can follow with our stuff. Okay, thank you. So we want to make sure that recreation is also done in a manner that complements the adjacent land uses, as well as um, complementing the, the, the permanent flood protection that is going to be uh, occurring with the diversion. And, and finally, we really see this as an opportunity to improve the quality of life uh, for residents um, within the Fargo-Moorhead area. 
And given that the, the channel is you know, approximately, or the whole diversion project is approximately 30 miles long and it's very linear in its nature, in turn, when we start thinking about recreation, one of the first things we that naturally come to mind would be a variety of different trail types uh, along, the, along the corridor. Uh, but we're also really wanting to be thinking about this in terms of also opportunities for place-based recreation as well. And our definition of recreation is actually, we want to be quite broad with this. And so we are also thinking about opportunities that possibly doing food production uh, along, the, along the corridor, see if there are opportunities for education and research, and maybe even possibly um, energy generation. Uh, so the project is a 15-month project. Uh, mm -hmm. We started in July and we'll be wrapping up in September of 2020. It is divided into three phases. We are currently in uh, the kind of coming towards the end of the first phase, which is really doing our, our homework and doing inventory and analysis and trying to understand what some of the recreation wants and needs are from the broader community. Uh, we, we're planning to wrap up this phase in September or October and then moving into developing concept alternatives uh, with the goal of coming up with a preferred alternative in, uh, in around April of 2020. Then moving forward from there, trying to wrap up our implementation strategy and final report uh, about this time in September of 2020. Um, as we are moving through the, the next phase, as we move into the um, concept alternatives, uh, we really want to be thinking right from the get-go about how we are going to do uh, and fund operations and maintenance associated with these recreational amenities. And so we will be trying to think about what are the various funding sources that might be available associated with these recreation opportunities. And that may actually drive what some of the selection of these, of these recreational opportunities are. Uh, so we'll be thinking about traditional granting, but we'll also be thinking if there are actually recreation uh, opportunities that actually could help create and generate revenue in and of themselves to help offset some of the operations and maintenance expenses associated with them. We'll also right away from the beginning start to think about um, what is the governance strategy uh, along this for recreation. Uh, given the length of this corridor, we really need to think about uh, whether it is one entity or a, a, a grouping of entities that will take responsibilities for different aspects of recreation along the corridor. So right now, um, we have a, a steering, um, steering review committee of stakeholders uh, who are guiding our work over the course of this project. And in addition, we have a public engagement plan already developed for each phase of, of our work. So right now, we do already have online, uh, an online survey out there right now on MetroCOG site. Um, for the general public to provide some insight, um, some insight on some uh, recreational opportunities they would like to see. And we will also be doing some pop-up engagement out at community events uh, for the, the communities along the corridor. Uh, so with that, I think I will close it up and ask if there are any questions. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Job. No questions. Um, I, I think it's an exciting opportunity that we don't talk about them enough, and I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see even just some of the ideas you've come up with already um, I hadn't even considered. So I'm looking forward to hearing back from you. Thank you so much for updating us. All right. Don't thank care. you very much. Yes. So I live along a dike, and I see so much activity on that walking, biking, all sorts of people are doing stuff in the water side where the water would come up, and it's been fantastic. I think that recreation as part of our project really helps out. And you don't always think about that, but uh, when winter comes, you hardly see anybody, but in the summer, spring, that all sorts of people utilize that. So I think for the greater project throughout the county and everywhere, it should help people if we can have some recreational. And I know in talking to Horace when we were talking about that as well, they felt that would be a great amenity to add to their dike as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <coughs> Leaders Task Force update. Anyone here from there? I don't believe so. Um, land management did not meet this month. Uh, you have a property status report in front of you. Um, Kim did talk about it up to an extent. Um, Eric, do you have anything you'd like to add? 
Um, I, not, I guess I maybe would just point out um, we've, we've uh, climbed over the 300 parcels acquired to date, Mark. Uh, I don't know that 300 is any more meaningful than 200 or 400, but uh, I thought that was interesting to note. We are about halfway complete with the channel, uh, making more and more progress. We have uh, a whole bunch of negotiations going on for properties along the diversion channel in the next few months will be pretty critical time as we worked through those negotiations. So uh, cross your fingers. I'm hoping we can have some good, successful negotiations with our property owners. Great, thank you. Um, and I would just also add that we've got a new entity with the Minnesota JPA. They will be doing a similar function that Cass County Joint Board does in acquiring property on the Minnesota side. So I don't know, Kevin, if you had anything you wanted to add to that since you're um, sharing that. No, actually, or, uh, excuse Mayor me, Judd JJ's. That. Yeah, okay. Mayor Judd, yes. I can defer to my elder, too. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't a slam. I only meant that by experience. And so please feel free to chime in, too, uh, Mr. Campbell, if I, I miss anything. Uh, we just had our first two meetings we met all, also today. I got some business accomplished. And I'd like to also thank uh, the people who are serving on that committee uh, to get that rolling as well. So I think we're looking at educating ourselves and looking forward to the process. So we'll defer to Commissioner Campbell. I think today's actions, uh, really what we did is, is um, we, you know, we didn't reinvent the wheel and we took what the Cass County Joint Water Resource District has done and who they've used for uh, deals. So uh, in terms of appraisals, we did uh, approve a five appraisal uh, companies to work with our Minnesota land acquisitions. And we did um, go with three uh, land acquisition um, uh, companies that help with the negotiations uh, of, of those. So, so the process is well on, and I think we're, and and we did get into the um, the area of where the core needed to have their. Um, help me out, right, uh, Eric. Uh, biotic and geomorphic monitoring there easements. You go. That yeah. one, yeah. <laughs> that was a mouthful. <laughs> I appreciate all of you that have um, volunteered to be on that committee as well, because I know you don't have enough meetings to go to. So, uh, Mayor Mahoney, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, Eric, I'm just curious. Now we're starting land acquisition. The people that have gone through the process, do they feel it's fair in the appraisal price, and or how we do the appraisal, and then how they're treated by the land acquisition team? Um, you know, we've actually been contemplating whether we should do some type of uh, a post survey or something to these property owners. Obviously, there's a, a bit of a mix. Some people are um, very satisfied and eager to work through the process, you know, wanting to move quicker. Um, other people are very resistant and, you know, don't want to sell at all. And, you know, most people are probably somewhere in the middle. Um, so I guess, I guess it sort of takes all sorts, but I, there hasn't been any major surprises, I guess, to date. So. Thank you. Did you have anything else to add for land acquisition, Eric? No, um, I thought we had a good meeting with the, the MIC board, as we're calling it now, because the other acronym is a mouthful, so it was a good meeting. And we do plan to meet next month for those of you that, um, for land acquisition, or land management, for those of you that are on that committee. <coughs> Great, thank you. Uh, is there any other business? I just want to send a quick uh, shout out uh, to council member Shelley uh, Carlson for uh, for being uh, willing to serve on this committee as well as the Mick board as well. Uh, obviously, uh, we know that this is a very important project and it takes a lot of time and energy and resources. So, I really appreciate her willingness to step up and dedicate herself to getting involved in this project. So. Thank you. And yes, I would reiterate that. Welcome so much, um, Council Member. We really appreciate you joining us. And uh, much thanks to former Council Member Paulson for his engagement with this board. Uh, you won't be missed because we'll be seeing you around. <laughs> so welcome again. And thank you, everyone. Uh, if there's no further business, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And we are adjourned. Thank you so much.